Hi, my name is Todd Schoenbaum. I'm a, an assistant clinical professor at UCLA. Uh, I'm also the assistant director for our continuing education department and the assistant director for our Center for Aesthetic Dentistry with Ed McLaren. Um, I also see patients one to two days a week in a private practice setting in our faculty group practice, also on the UCLA campus. So the two programs we did today, we did one on the, an introduction to dental photography. Um, my sincere hope with the program is that it helps uh, people feel more comfortable starting out on which sometimes can be a rocky path. Uh, sometimes what we found at UCLA is that doctors that want to introduce dental photography into their practice, they know the advantages, but they just quite aren't sure where to start. So my hope is that this program kind of provides an easy entry point an easy way for people to quickly and effectively introduce photography on a day-to-day -day basis. For me, if it's not practical, if it's not high quality, it's not going to work, and that's kind of what we are trying to accomplish in, in the photography program. Um, so it is a, it's an introductory level course, and it's designed to help get people uh, start with photography, and it's, it's not too technically complicated. Uh, the, uh, the other program we did was um, immediate implant provisionals, particularly in the aesthetic zone. And so uh, my goal for that program is to help the prosthetic dentists establish some techniques and some protocols that, um, that I've found to be highly effective, not just with myself, but with my residents. And uh, basically in creating a, a very predictable, definitive outcome through the use of uh, the, the provisional restoration. Um, additionally, some of the techniques we developed also seem to be allowing us to, to increase the, the gingival volume post-surgically with uh, proper use of that provisional restoration. So we're very excited about a lot of the techniques and the papers we've put, produced as a result of that, and uh, I hope to join me for that program. So what, what I've seen with my residents in terms of problems with the implant prosthetics is that oftentimes we have a fairly reasonable provisional restoration that either the resident or the patient just kind of simply views as a temporary like any other. And then when we get to the definitive restoration, the, uh, the cast has been modified or the emergence profiles have been modified such that the soft tissue aesthetics and the final result maybe bear no relation to the soft tissue aesthetics that we had in the provisional. And so the nice thing about the techniques that we talk about in that program is sorting out all the questions and the potential soft tissue aesthetics before moving ahead to the definitive restoration. So it's a really nice way to uh, sort of if quickly establish the, the gingival architecture before we ever even get to the definitive restoration. And so it takes a lot of the questions out of the procedure. So for new developments in, in implant prosthetics, um, most of the development has been in fine tuning that which has, we've had for, for a while already. So we're getting stronger ceramic materials which we're more comfortable with on top of an implant. Uh, things obviously like Emacs and uh, many of the lithium disilicate um, similar restorations are gonna be coming. Uh, we're not using a lot of the all, all zirconia restorations for obvious aesthetic reasons in the interior. But I would say, in, in my opinion and in my experience, what I've found to be the, the, the most interesting developments in implant prosthetics has been a move towards more well-defined protocols and techniques as a profession. Uh, the surgical side has had this for quite a while, but on the prosthetic side, we've been somewhat lacking a lot of variability, a lot of variability in outcomes. And I think as a, as a discipline within the profession, we're getting more streamlined and, and towards more consensus in terms of what is effective to create the ideal or best potential outcomes in those cases. In dental photography, the most important advances we're seeing are in terms of our ability to communicate both with each other as colleagues and with our patients. Um, it used to be you know, not, not all that long ago that the images were taken and they had to be sent off to, this, to have the slides processed. Obviously a fairly ineffective way to communicate with colleagues or patients. And it's gotten to the point now where we even have the ability to wirelessly transfer the images to, uh, to monitors to show the patients exactly in real time what we're seeing as part of the clinical exam. Um, the ability to share with patients on a very large, very detailed, of course with very well-composed images, 
um, exactly what their pathology is and what their treatment potentials are and, and what their potential treatment outcomes could be. So um, the, the cameras themselves obviously continue to increase in resolution, so we're getting more and more uh, resolution, although with most of our digital displays, um, that isn't our highest concern at this point. Most, most any SLR camera now, when properly equipped and properly set up, will produce very high quality images um, for dental photography. So mostly what we're seeing is, uh, I guess the most exciting thing I'm seeing in dental photography is greater and greater interest in it. And so uh, it used to be quite a novelty in the profession, kind of the, the only, only the people that were lecturing and publishing were the only ones taking images. And now we're seeing a rapid increase in the number of uh, not just clinicians, but also uh, technicians that'll take images uh, of their procedures. And so um, it's really rewarding for me to be able to see that increased level of communication, you know, amongst ourselves and then certainly with the patients. And, and I appreciate the, the level of enthusiasm it creates on, on both sides. So uh, that's what I'm liking best about photography now. Uh, so, in coordination with, um, with Photomed, I developed a, a prototype for a, a lingual contrastor. Is if, if you've done any dental photography in your own practice, you've probably noticed uh, tongues and uh, saliva and cheeks and things creeping into the images. And uh, it, it just lends an image that looks a little messy and a little uh, ill-composed. And uh, so through kind of a relatively simple device and uh, a relatively simple design, we have a, a nice instrument that allows us to get uh, really clean buckle images, which are especially nice when we're working in the posterior areas of the mouth for uh, implant dentistry. So um, I think Photomed has that available now. Uh, so for my personal life, when I'm not doing dentistry, uh, my, what I do for fun, I guess you might say, is uh, photography and probably not in the way that, that most people expect. I actually have a, my own personal dark room and uh, do all the processing myself. It's kind of a very a throwback, you might say, so it's all film and um, kind of very uh, intricate and tedious, some might say, but I enjoy that quite a bit. And, uh, and then I also enjoy uh, cycling quite a bit as well. So that's between my wife and uh, photography in the dark room and out on the bike uh, keeps me pretty busy. For more education programs, visit the Guide Institute at www.guidedental.com.